Uh, growing up in the west of Ireland, my grandmother lived with us. Um, but it's only recently that I started to reflect on how come she lived so long and so well with all of her cognitive faculties in place. Was it genetics? Well, longevity ran in her family. But more recently, I started to think that there could be something else. And I have a gut feeling that it was. And one of the things my granny used to say is, long before it became a TV catchphrase, she said, you are what you eat, so eat well. And indeed, the quest for finding this uh, fountain of youth is something that has fascinated mankind for millennia. Um, none less than uh, the famous Russian uh, immunologist, Eli Mechnikov. Now, Mechnikov uh, worked at the um, Pasteur Institute in Paris at the turn of the last century. And he won a Nobel Prize for all of his famous work uh, in immunology. But as often happens to famous scientists, later on in their careers, they can start coming up with some crazy ideas. And Mechnikov wasn't short of these. And one of his crazy ideas was, why did people in parts of what is now uh, Bulgaria, why do they live longer? And uh, he put it down to the fact that they ate a lot of fermented foods containing lactic acid bacteria. So you are what you eat, but Mechnikov's work also hinted at something else. What if you're not just what you eat, but you're what your microbes eat? And what's important to, re to uh, reinforce is that over the last two decades, we have began to really understand the, that there is a very important relationship between our microbes uh, and our overall uh, physiology. But first thing I want to really reinforce is that we are living in a microbial world. Um, these trillions of bacteria that are, uh, that are within us and on us are really uh, uh, shaping a lot of what we do. For example, in terms of genes, we are 99% microbial. It's quite humbling. If you think of all of the money we've spent on the Human Genome Project, well, it's less than 1% of our genes. Now, if I had given this talk 18 months ago, uh, I would have told you that we have 10 times more microbial cells than we do human cells. But this is a really fast-moving field with changes in technology and mathematical models happening all the time. And so, more recently, this 10 to 1 has been uh, downsized to 1.3 to 1. So we're still more microbial, but just about. So later, when you go to the bathroom and you shed some of these microbes, just think you are becoming more human. <laughs> um, recently, we've been revisiting Mechnikov's ideas, and we've shown that, for example, in aged animals, that there is a decline uh, in how this microbiome uh, is working, and that we can correlate changes in the microbiome with uh, cognitive decline and anxiety. Moreover, work from my colleagues in Cork has shown uh, a clear relationship in an elderly population between the composition and the diversity of the microbiome uh, with health outcomes. With elderly people with more diverse microbes had much better uh, um, uh, um, indices of uh, frailty and cognitive uh, health. So you are what you eat and you are what your microbes eat. And that would have been interesting enough, but they, the Cork researchers went one step further, and they showed that what was, and they investigated what was driving this diversity. And they put it down to actually, it was the diversity of the diet. With people who have a, 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 a bland uh, diet full of processed food that was very repetitive, having a large uh, shrinking uh, in their microbiome, whereas those with a much more diverse diet, full of fruits and vegetables, having a much better uh, 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 diversity in the microbiome. So you are what your microbes eat, and this will affect your overall health. And the, one of the big questions we have in this field is, how do microbes in your gut 
uh, influence your health in so many ways. And w- the main thing I want to get, get across today is that microbes are little factories producing all sorts of weird and wonderful chemicals that our bodies would not uh, make without them. And these chemicals, depending on what foodstuffs you, you, you take in, uh, can be really benefiting all aspects of health. So we can modify our diet, or we can actually modify the microbes to actually shape this. And perhaps there is no better example uh, of this uh, uh, interaction between microbes and diet uh, than early in life, uh, in breast milk. Human breast milk is, uh, is uh, unique among mammals in its complexity. It contains a lot of very specific sugars that uh, is not present in cow's milk, for example. And we know that these sugars are very good for supporting gut health and immune function. But for me, perhaps the most startling thing is that these sugars cannot be digested by the baby. They are, as an exquisite example of co-evolution, they are uh, digested by the microbes uh, instead. And so uh, we, uh, we know that the chemicals that these microbes make then will support a lot of different aspects of health, including uh, brain development. And this is probably underlying some of the beneficial effects uh, seen uh, with breastfeeding. Another component of breast milk are the fatty acids. And among fatty acids, you may have heard of omega-3s. Well, we've recently shown that omega-3 fatty acids can also affect the composition of your microbes. And if we deplete uh, omega-3s in the diet in animals, we can really change the trajectory of brain development uh, and behavior. So your brain health depends on what your microbes are eating. Another component of the diet that is receiving a lot of attention are the polyphenols. Now, when I first heard about polyphenol, it sounded like some sort of 70s disco queen. Uh, But polyphenols are really important uh, dietary substances, uh, most talked about as as they're found in uh, dark chocolate and and in red wine. Uh, Less talked about is how they're also found in onions and grape juice and green tea. But uh, polyphenols have been shown to have really good anti-aging properties and affect uh, learning and memory as well. And more recently, it's been shown that a lot of polyphenols actually don't don't get absorbed, but get down to your lower gut and get acted upon by your microbes. Moreover, polyphenols will affect the composition of these microbes. So once again, uh, you are what your microbes are eating. So omega-3s, polyphenols. Could we devise a diet that would be rich in these that might have some beneficial effect on our health? Well, we don't have to go too far, just to the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean diet has long been known uh, to have beneficial effects in cardiovascular health and to lower the incidence of stroke, diabetes, obesity, and heart uh, disease. So, uh, and it is a really rich source of both uh, polyphenols and omega-3s. And what about the Mediterranean diet and brain health? Well, just this year, uh, a study was published from Australia to show that adding a modified uh, Mediterranean diet to normal uh, psychotherapy or antidepressant medication was, uh, was enough to have profound effects on mood. And these types of studies are ushering in a whole new discipline of nutritional psychiatry, where we can target mental health through dietary means, in a way going back to Hippocrates, uh, where he said, let food uh, be our medicine. And perhaps the missing part of this puzzle is, well, what is the role of the microbes in mediating these positive effects? And that's still uh, to be resolved, but I really think that they play a crucial part. And why can I be so confident? Well, it goes back to some of our studies, uh, in basic neuroscience studies that we have in animals. Now, you don't need to be a neuroscientist to see here that when we take microbes out of a system, these are germ-free mice, they've never had any microbes, and these brains grow up without uh, any, uh, any gut microbes. But you can see clearly that there are marked differences in this nerve cell from uh, the germ-free versus the control uh, animal. 
And we've, we've shown that almost all aspects of brain health are dependent on having microbes in our gut. For example, in the last year, we've shown that myelin, myelin is the key insulation on which nerve cells communicate, and that myelination is totally regulated by microbes in the gut. And so if we can develop diets that will target the microbiome to support brain health at crucial developmental windows, we may uh, benefit a lot of people. And where this is going to be really important, for example, is in areas of severe malnutrition and undernutrition, such as in sub-Saharan Africa, where you have uh, lots of individuals with stunted growth and cognitive decline, delay and, and neurodevelopmental problems. And so a lot of efforts are going in uh, to try uh, and uh, develop uh, strategies for this. Now, up until now, everything I've told you has been about how diet affects our microbes. But could our microbes also affect our diet and food choices? And that's something that I find quite intriguing. And uh, again, just this year, uh, a study came from uh, Lisbon where they used a lab fruit fly to actually ask this. Now, fruit flies uh, it, it, it are if you deprive them of protein in their diet and you give them a choice of uh, yeast or sugar, uh, yeast for a fruit fly is kind of like their steak. So if they're, if they're protein deprived, they'll go right after uh, the yeast. However, if you put microbes into the situation, uh, you can uh, see that the animal no longer uh, chooses the protein. It actually gravitates towards the sugar as well. And if this could be shown in other species, it would have huge implications for uh, our, 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 the, the, the drive we have to take certain foods. And perhaps later, the next time that you crave that dark chocolate bar full of polyphenols, uh, perhaps it's your microbes that's telling you to go for it. One of the best ways that we have for studying microbe diet interactions is looking at the microbes of some of our ancestors. And scientists have gone out into the field and started to study what is going on in uh, communities that maintain ancestral-like diets. And for example, in the Hadza hunter-gatherer community uh, in Tanzania, uh, they've shown that this, they have diets very rich in fiber. Fiber is key in this regard. And in, when they looked at their microbiome, they were able to see a very, very diverse microbiome. Moreover, we can chart the influence of the introduction of agriculture by looking at the microbiome and the diets of people in uh, rural Malawi and uh, Venezuela. And you can clearly see that there starts to be a decline uh, in, in, in this microbiome. And then in our Western world, what you see is with the introduction of processed food and sweeteners and emulsifiers, all of which are having negative impact on the microbiome, that we are more or less extinguishing microbes that our ancestors had. The intriguing part of this story is that if you look at diseases like multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, these are not present in these ancestral communities. And a lot of uh, interest is now being put into understanding the relationship that these missing microbes have in driving these diseases. Um, and we know little about what's going on in relation to brain health and the contribution of this depletion of microbes has uh, to brain health. What we do know is that in the society that we're living in, which is increases in stress and overuse of antibiotics, hypercleanliness, uh, a huge upsurge in uh, births by cesarean sections, all of which will impact the composition of the microbiome, that we are potentially having a public health uh, problem in our midst. And this will also potentially affect our brain and how we deal uh, with stress. But how do we deal with this? And can we develop strategies, perhaps to target the microbiome uh, for uh, mental health benefits? And that brings us to the whole concept of a, of a term we coined in Cork, uh, psychobiotics. And these are targeted interventions that will uh, uh, focus on our microbiome to actually promote uh, brain health. 
And to date, most of the studies with psychobiotics have been only at the preclinical stage in animals, but slowly we're doing more and more, and, and around the world more and more work is going in to get evidence-based for uh, this whole uh, new area. And uh, just think though, your genome, you can't, the genes that you got from your parents and your grandparents, you can't do an awful lot with it. But your microbiome, you can modify potentially through diet, prebiotics, probiotics, and even fecal transplants eventually. So um, there is a slow psychobiotic revolution taking place and changing how we might consider treating uh, mental illness uh, into the future. So in conclusion, I guess my advice is always trust the words of an Irish granny. <laughs> Eat well, and perhaps some of that wisdom uh, comes from the trillions of bacteria uh, within your gut. And I hope that's given you some food for thought today. Thank you very much. <laughs>